Welcome and good evening. Tonight we have another collection of true scary stories to help you sleep with a special guest and friend, Bad Vibes. Also, after a great suggestion from one of you guys in a previous video, Perry I'm looking at you, I'm starting an open advice column in the comments. If you're stuck with a life problem or just need guidance, you either leave a comment and you guys can help each other out, or if it's something more private, you can email me and I'll start an advice column section at the end of each video where I'll answer your anonymous questions. Let me know what you guys think. Anyway, if you do enjoy, please be sure to subscribe because currently over 50% of you guys watching aren't already. But anyway, without further ado, let's begin. One time I went to a bar with one of my friends. I had just turned 21, so I haven't been to much bars up to that point. My friend was drinking on the way to the bar, so he was already pretty drunk when we got there. When I sat at the bar, a cute girl came and talked to me and my friend. She said her name was Candace, and I noticed she had really, really bright red hair. I assumed that she had dyed it. It was pretty, but unnatural. Anyways, uh, this girl was flirting with me and my friend. She could tell my friend was already very drunk. To be honest, I played along like I was drunk already too, since it seemed to be working for my friend. I didn't know if she was just trying to get free drinks, so I told her we didn't have much money. She kept buying us drinks and I started to get confused as to who she liked between me and my friend. My friend went to the bathroom. Before he came back, he was kicked out by the bouncers. He was too drunk. Candace and I went outside with him. She kept telling him to go home with her. He was so out of it he could barely answer her. I told her he was too drunk and that I couldn't let him go anywhere. I didn't want him to wake up hungover in some random house with no car and no idea what happened. Candace kept pushing it, saying that she would take care of him, but I told her no because I had to stay with him. I was more sober than him, he was my responsibility. I told her the only way he was going anywhere was if I tagged along. I assumed she thought that I was jealous or caught blocking but my friend could barely stand and lost interest in Candace already at that point. She immediately started flirting with me and offered to get my friend a taxi to drive him home and said we could go to her place alone. At this point I had a few drinks and I was pretty buzzed so I agreed. We took my friend to the taxi and walked to her car. I slightly stumbled on the way to her car. Whoa, you're pretty drunk huh? She said smiling as she held on to one of my arms. Yeah, I said. I don't know why, but I just felt slightly shy and anxious. Everything was just happening too easy for me, so I felt uneasy. We got into the car and we drove down the street. We stop at the liquor store and get some more to drink. I'll buy it, don't worry about paying, she offered. I didn't want to drink any more than I already had. I was already buzzed and wanted to be able to carry myself throughout the rest of the night. Sometimes I made myself look stupid when I'm drunk, so I didn't want to ruin anything with Candace more than I already did earlier by telling her my friend was too drunk. I told her I was already drunk enough, but she insisted. I didn't want to seem lame, so I told her to get me a pint of liquor with some apple juice to chase it. She went in the store and came out with a lot more than just a pint. I assumed she wanted to drink more also and that's why she got a fifth instead of a pint. On the car ride we passed the bottle back and forth but she took tiny sips. I tried to take tiny sips but she kept passing me the bottle and telling me to drink. I somehow managed to drink all of my apple juice and pretend to drink the bottle by spitting the liqueur in the apple juice bottle. I tossed the apple juice bottle full of liqueur out of the window before she saw it. I didn't want her to know I was acting drunker than what she had actually believed. I was a sloppy drunk when I was simply buzzed. I took a couple more sips of liquor and finished the bottle. Throughout the car ride I called her the wrong name a couple of times to get a reaction out of her. She didn't react to it. She just kept letting me call her Carla without correcting me. For some reason I thought she lied to me about her name initially. We drove up to her house. I pretended to trip and stumble into her front door. She helped me walk inside by holding me up. She opened her front door, which was unlocked. We walked in her house. She closed her front door and then locked it. I thought that was strange, but assumed she didn't want anyone walking in on us. I told her that I'd had to use the bathroom. I walked into her bathroom, locked the door, and looked in the mirror. 
I just felt strange. I felt like something was off. I felt myself becoming more drunk from finishing the bottle earlier. I had turned on the sink to make noise and made myself puke up the liquor I drank. I flushed and went to the sink and started drinking the tap water out of my hands to sober up. I just didn't want to be drunk but I still wanted to hook up with Candace so I wanted to pretend to be drunk. I turned the sink off and I could hear her talking to someone. He's drunk as hell. He can barely stand up. You do it. Who was she talking to? And do what? I walked out to the bathroom and into the living room. The moment I stepped into the living room, I saw her walking into another room. All I could see was the back of her head. That strange, very bright red hair go into another room. I didn't see her face. I just saw her kind of walk fast into the room. The living room was pretty dark. Hey, where are you going? I slurred like I was drunk. She walked back into the dark living room and up to me. Let's go into my room, she said. I looked at her bright red hair and then into her eyes. They were different. Her face was different. It was another girl with the same hair. That's when I realised. It was another girl with the same wig on. It was a wig the whole time. She had changed it with the girl from earlier for whatever reason. My heart felt like it stopped, but I tried to look like I had no idea that it was a different girl. I kind of smiled at her and told her I just needed to use the bathroom one more time and told her sorry I was so drunk. She said it's fine, just hurry up in there. I went into the bathroom and locked the door. I heard a whisper something to someone again. This time I think I heard a male voice whisper back. I honestly didn't concentrate on listening to exactly what she said. Something sketchy was going on and I had to get out of that house. I opened the bathroom window and jumped straight out of it and ran faster than I'd ever ran in my life. I didn't look behind myself. I just ran through the backyard, jumped the fence and ran through someone else's backyard, hit the road and ran towards the main road. I kept running down the main road until I saw a star CVS and I ran into the CVS and stood straight at the front of the store in front of the camera. I called a taxi and went home. I tried to think of what happened that night. What was she or they planning that night? Why did she tell me a fake name? Why was she trying to get my friend and I so drunk? I thought maybe a robbery, but she kept spending money on us. She kept buying us drinks and even paid for my friend's taxi cab. And mostly, why did she wear a wig that she gave to another girl to wear? Who was she talking to? What did it mean? And what was in that room they tried to lure me into? The next day after this incident, I went back to the house with a couple of friends to see what was going on, but nobody was there. No cars, no people. Nothing. Just an empty house. I ended up finding out that the house was a summer rental and whoever those people were, they broke into the house and used it for only that night and never came back. This is something that was super traumatic for me, but it was never discussed again in my household. I was talking with my mum about it the other night, and she still didn't say much. Thought I would share my thoughts with you all. When I was 13, I got a Dell desktop for school. The internet was fairly new for me back in 2003. AOL, MySpace, Yahoo Messenger, and AOL chat room. 16, female, Cali, anyone? AOL chat rooms was where I went. I was a shy, overweight kid back then still shy to this day. Online, I could be anyone. I could see anything. It was amazing. I discovered so many things when I got to the internet. If I could be anyone, so could someone else. Thus, who I met one 27-year-old man. One night I logged on. The OL dial-up sound still made me feel uneasy. I was sitting in my cold, dark kitchen. The computer was here so I could be monitored. It was just me and my mum though, and she was always working, so no one ever really monitored me. Plus, she had no idea how to use a computer, so I got away with a lot. I was bored, so I hopped onto an AOL chat room, lurked for a bit, then 15 year old female here. I was really 13, but saying I was 15 made me feel so much more mature. Private message incoming. Hey, my name is Rob, where are you from? And that's how it started. I told him where I was from, and I was in high school, which wasn't a lie. 
my school was from 7 to 12th grade. You, 19, male, New York. Oh man, was it cool to be talking to an older guy? And boy, was he cute. Honestly, I didn't really remember much. Maybe I blanked it out. Maybe my memory is just shot. I don't remember emails back and forth. The occasional phone call. I remember finding out he was talking to another girl and I wanted to break things off. But he begged and pleaded until I caved. Then, the let's meet. I was nervous. He had never asked for a pic. Had never really asked for much from me. Just the emails back and forth. A phone call a day. But somehow he made me feel safe. Made me feel wanted. Cared for. He drove from New York to see me one day. My mum worked right beside my house, so he parked about a quarter mile away and took the back alley to enter my house. My friend was with me when he showed up, but was scared when she seen him and ran out the back door. I maybe should have taken a hint from that, but I just stood at the back porch with my head down, was given a hug, and he led me inside. Not five minutes after being there, sitting on the couch, did he move things further then further, even into my bedroom. I won't get into the details of what happened next. I assumed most of you can guess. After that, he left, with instructions to get in his car after I get off the school bus and we will go on a date. I had no idea where he was staying. I lived extremely far in the country, an hour's drive from the closest hotel. The next day, I get ready for school, ride the bus for a 45 minute drive, and as soon as I hop off in the school parking lot, I get directly into his car. No one noticed. No one said anything. We drive around. Never go on a date. He just finds different places to park so that he can use me. I notice a photo of another young girl, 15 or 16, in the visor of his car. I question him. I believe him when he tells me it's his cousin. Believe when I question why his hairline is receding so much. I believe him when he tells me I can't see his driver's license because he left it in a hotel. I believe him when he said he loved me. I get dropped back off at school, super sad that he was going back home, with promises he will call. Again, everything feels fuzzy. I can't remember many emotions from this time. I do remember that a few days later my mum says she found out I skipped school with a man, that I was never to see him again and that was that. I do remember sending an email. I do remember a late night phone call. I do remember saying I wish I could just live with you. I remember him suggesting to come get me. I remember saying okay. Days later by the time he made the drive again, I was feeling iffy about leaving my mum. I loved her after all. I didn't think things through. I didn't put much thought into anything really. Packed a few clothes in a suitcase. Forgot all underwear. That is one of my sharpest memories. I felt bad that he drove 8 hours to get me, so I left in the middle of the night, got in the car to him and his cousin. He got in the back seat with me, proceeded to have sex with me while his cousin drove, then got back in the front seat. This happened a few times between my home and his. The drive took forever. I had nothing to drink. Was offered nothing when they got something. They stopped to nap at a rest stop and I attempted to collect call my mum, which was disabled on our phone. I dug around for some change to get something to drink but couldn't afford anything in the convenience store, so I drank out of the truck stop sink. Hours later, we park a block away from his house while he runs to get something. I'm sitting in the back seat, waking up from a nap when around eight or so men and women in black suits around the car, screaming for us to get out with our hands up. My first thought is shit, first 10 minutes in New York and I'm already being robbed. I'm terrified. I get out and a man pulls me over to the curb while the other officers force his cousin onto the ground. All the while, they're asking me my name and age, telling me to tell his cousin my age. I'm put in the back of an unmarked car, driven to the NYPD, past reporters, cameras, news trucks, snuck into the back of a station where I see Rob in handcuffs for the last time. And for in love 14 year old me, this is devastating. I'm taken into a room in question for hours. I'm then taken to the hospital. 
Then a hotel where a nice woman brings me a Taco Bell and stays with me as I fall asleep. The next day, two FBI officers escort me home on a plane. Where I get off and where I am greeted by police officers, my mother and a horde of news reporters. I later found out that when my mum reported me missing, the police didn't want to do much. They didn't even take the picture of me. She had the license plate number. She remembered seeing his car parked by the road at the first meeting. She took notes since it was an out of state car. Thanks to her being vigilant, I do find this the only reason I am alive today. The police said they would look into it, but that wasn't enough for my mum. She contacted a family friend who in turn contacted the governor of she contacted a family friend, who in turn contacted the governor, who in turn made the police look further into it. After they ran the license plate, looked into the man, found out who he was, that was when they issued an Amber Alert. Noting that I was in extreme danger, my cousin told my mum that he looked at Rob's rap sheet and it was a mile long, but wouldn't tell my mother what was on it, for fear of scaring her more. I never went to court. I never went to any hearings, but I did fall into a horrible depression. My friend's parents wouldn't let them hang out with me. People spray painted slut on my locker at school. I had no friends, but most of all I thought a man was in prison for loving me. When I learned he got sentenced to 10 years in prison, which he served every year of, I became deeply troubled. I was in and out of mental hospitals for self-harm for years, on a slew of depression medication. Psychiatrists never talked to me about anything. I had to process it all myself. My teenage years were better though. I had transferred schools, made best friends, graduated. But still in the back of my mind, I felt that I was the reason a man lost 10 years of his life. Until I was told he was let out of prison. A couple of years after he was out, I contacted him on Facebook. At the time I was around 24 or 25. He told me that if I ever contacted him again, he would kill both me and my mother, that he still knows where I live. I had no idea what he had planned to do with me. My mum still says selling me to a sex trafficker. I was told that he had done that with other girls my age that he was talking to. Some good things happened because of my kidnapping. Schools all over my state started internet safety and education classes. Kids were taught safety. Parents were taught how to keep kids safe. No other girls were taken by this man. So to the man who ruined my ye So to the man who ruined so many years of my life. I am 29 now. I am happy, healthy, and I have zero remorse that you are now listed as a level 3 sex offender and that you were in prison for so many years. Back in about 2000 or 2001. I was driving by myself from visiting my mum in Colorado back to Arizona. I was in a station wagon and had a desk my mum had given me that was my grandfather's. I have always been scared driving at night, but there is someone in my back seat that is going to get me. This might be because of too many scary movies or because my mum's paranoia rubbed off on me. I was in the army and drove back and forth a lot to visit her. She would get mad at me for sleeping at rest stops or gas stations and tell me someone was going to kidnap me and kill me. But I just didn't want to be bothered with the hassle and expense of a motel most of the time. I digress. So I'm driving an empty stretch of highway late at night with no other cars around. This red truck comes up behind me flashing his lights and honking his horn at me. I was thinking to myself that there was something wrong with my car or maybe there was something wrong with the desk and the hatchback. Because why else would be because why else would he be so insistent on me pulling over? So I pull over, I was in my mid twenties and still a bit naive, and I get out of my car. As I'm getting out of my car, he's directly behind me and still flashing his lights and honking his horn. I got to about the middle of the car. I planned on going to the back to see what he could have been I planned to go into the back to see I planned on going to the back to see what could have been wrong with my car when it hit me. Why is he still honking at me? And when I'm out of my car? It is a bit odd. Then he got out of his truck. That's when I knew something just wasn't right. I jumped back in my car and sped off. The next exit was 45 miles away or so. He followed me the entire time. I take the first exit and go to a crowded grocery store with a laundromat next to it. 
There was an ambulance parked at the laundromat with its lights flashing and I was next to it. I figured if there was an ambulance that eventually a police officer should come. The man stayed in his truck in the grocery store parking lot watching me the entire time. I was terrified. I didn't want to get out of my car and felt like an idiot if I would have to tell someone what had happened. I waited about an hour and he finally left. After he left, I waited a little longer before continuing my drive back to Arizona. I was paranoid and watchful for any red trucks the entire time. But fast forward about 5 or 6 years. I'm watching unsolved mysteries or something similar. I'm watching unsolved mysteries or similar s- I'm watching unsolved mysteries or some similar type crime show with my hubby at the time. He knew what had happened when we were dating. He knew what had happened because we were dating at the time. And what story pops up? About a man on the exact same stretch of highway with a red truck that used those exact tactics to get a few women to pull over and murder them. I really am glad my gut told me something was wrong and to get back in my car and drive. Back in the summer of 2010, I fell victim to unexpected predators. Predators so unexpected, I can hardly believe it really happened when I look back on it. It was a type of experience that made me question whether or not I would survive. I was out late with my boyfriend, Richie. We were both 17 or 18 years old and had just graduated trade school, where we also met. We were living together on our own. We were living our best lives, no matter how little money we had. We loved spending most nights with one of our best friends at the time. His name was Daniel. Most nights we spent with Daniel were filled with late night drives, munchie runs, and video game sleepovers. We always had fun, just laughing and being dumb kids. We didn't really party or surround ourselves with drama or drugs. We did, however, like to drink once in a while. I don't approve of underage drinking at all now, but I know it happens. It is reality. This particular night, we had done what we did most nights. We drove around in Daniel's black two-door Honda Civic. We were listening to Strillix, blasting it all the way up. We decided to go to the grocery store to pick up some snacks and some wine coolers. At the time, I was texting my best girlfriend, Charlotte. It was around 7 p.m. and I missed her so much, so I asked her if she wanted us to go pick her up. She was off work and said, yes, absolutely. Charlotte wants to hang out with us, I told Daniel. All right, we'll go get her. Tell her we're on our way. So I text Charlotte and told her to get ready soon. I couldn't wait to see her. It had been weeks since I last seen her and I knew that she missed me too. We did still talk every day, but seeing her is the best thing. We had talked about a new album by the band Red. She said her brother had bought it and she said she wanted me to listen to it. I asked her to ask her brother if it was okay if I borrowed it and he agreed. So I told her not to forget it when I picked her up. We arrived at her place around 730 and she lives in a mobile home community, pretty close to where we were picking up our snacks and drinks. I text her, letting her know that we had arrived, and she came out of her place about two minutes later. She got in the car and we headed to Daniel's house. When we arrived, I realized that I left my wallet and the red album in the car. I thought, it's fine, I'll get that stuff later. We sat in the kitchen and started drinking and eating some munchies. I had actually started to feel sick earlier that day, so I only drank one wine cooler. The night went well. As it progressed, we sat around talking and enjoying the night. Around 11 p.m., Charlotte all of a sudden said, Shit, my coworker just texted me and asked me to cover her shift tomorrow morning. No, don't leave us, I interrupted, laughing. She laughed and said, I want to stay, but I need the extra cash. We tried to convince her to stay, but she asked if we could take her home. Daniel was really drunk at this point. I had my learner's permit at the time, so I offered to drive since I was the only one sober. I figured it would also make good driving practice. So we proceeded to load up in the car and I headed carefully to drop off Charlotte. We listened to music as always on the way 
and laughed about how drunk Daniel was. He wasn't puking or anything, but he was saying many funny things. This is a great night, I remember thinking. We finally get to Charlotte's house, and I park in her driveway. We say our goodbyes, and she got out of the car. I stayed in the driveway until I saw that she made it into her place safely. I was by no means professional at driving at this time, so I drove all the way up the street in the opposite direction we came in, so I can just turn around at the next street and make a wide turn to drive back in the opposite direction again. I was terrible at adjusting cars. Let's just say, I really needed the most practice making turns and parking. When I finally turned the car around to drive in the opposite direction, I realized I positioned the car too close to another car that was parked on the street. So I pressed the brake pedal, proceeded to try to reverse away from the car I parked too close to. Just as I put the car in reverse, we all gasped as we saw a small, gray, and very shitty looking pickup reverse very quickly in front of us. I panicked a little because it was abrupt. I thought for sure that they were going to hit us. The truck stopped and I expected the driver to reposition the truck and drive away. I was very wrong. All of a sudden, two young Hispanic guys who appeared to be in their late teens or early 20s jumped quickly out of the truck and ran towards the Honda. I froze. I couldn't process what was happening. But one of them came to my side of the car, the other to the passenger side, where Richie was sitting. I didn't know that the car was unlocked. I regret not locking the doors because as soon as they got to the car, they opened the door and started yelling at us to get the hell out of the car. They made us get out in the fear and panic that was upon us. When I got out of the car, I looked at this guy in front of me. I felt the worst fear I had ever felt in my life. I looked into his eyes and could tell he was high or something. I saw so much hatred and anger in his eyes. I knew this guy was out to hurt someone. I made it a point not to make too much eye contact, but made sure I got a good look at him. He was about 5 foot 6 inches tall. He was thin, tan skin, and short spiky brown hair. He was wearing skinny light blue jeans and a blue plaid long sleeve shirt. On his face sat a round set of glasses with light blue tint. I didn't get a good look at the other guy because I was fixated on the threat in front of me. I just remember he had dark hair and it was about the same height as the other guy. I was so scared I didn't even know what was going on. All I could hear was, what the fuck are you doing at my girl's house? Pointed at Daniel and loudly asked, my girl's cheating on me with this fucker? Claudia's with this fucker? At the moment, he and the other guy started going through the car. They took my wallet and the red album and threw it out on the street. I whimpered in reply, No, we just dropped off a friend. We don't know any Claudia. He replied loud and aggressive, Which friend? You're lying. I didn't want to give up my best friend's name, obviously. So I responded, Maria, we came to drop off my friend Maria. We don't know a Claudia. Please leave us alone. I was terrified and careful about what I said or did because I didn't know if they had any weapons. I know we all had the same thought because we were all trying to remain calm. I didn't try anything even though I didn't see any weapons. In my head, I knew it was a possibility so I tried to remain calm. Before I knew it, the spiky guy grabbed my arm and started to lead me up the street. He said, All right, take me to your house then. I want to talk to Maria. He said calmly, Okay, I'll take you and show you. I'll prove to you that we don't know Claudia. We walked a few feet in silence, dozens of things going through my head. I was not about to lead him to Charlotte. I thought about running for it. I thought about pleading with him. I had no idea what to do. I turned around to try to assure him again. I said, I really don't know Claudia. He didn't say anything. He just looked at me and looked back at his friend that he had left with Richie and Daniel. I guess he decided better and didn't want to leave his partner behind because he left me alone on the street and took off running back down the street to the other guys. I took the opportunity to run behind one of the mobile homes and try to get back closer to the car. 
I thought about asking one of the neighbors to call the cops, but I was hesitant because after all, it was really late at night and I probably wouldn't get an answer. Or maybe if I did, I would just get the door slammed on my face. Just then, as I run farther down the houses, through the back, I saw Daniel turn the corner and headed towards me. Where's Richie? I frantically asked. I don't know. We both came looking for you. Richie then appeared behind the mobile homes too, and we were just so thankful to see each other. We peered around the mobile homes and decided it was safe to go back to the car. We ran fast. I ran so fast I could feel my pants falling off. I jumped into the back seat of the car without hesitation. Daniel had sobered up by the end of all that and decided to drive home. We were all so shocked, angry, and scared that we just all knew what to do and how to position ourselves in the car. I asked them what happened while I was by myself. They said they squared up with the guys. They fist fought for a couple of minutes and the other guys took off on foot. Richie said he didn't even get hit. He said that the guy looked like he was either high or drunk. We drove back to Daniel's house. We called the cops on the way there. They arrived 10 minutes later. I was shooken up. I was crying and my stomach felt like it was turned upside down. The cops took all our statements. They said that they'll do their best to get this solved, but we never heard anything back about the incident. Nobody blamed me for it, but I had several regrets. I thought it was my fault for not locking the door. I thought how stupid it was that I froze up. I didn't know what I was going to do when the spiky haired guy took me alone up the street. I was terrified of what he had in mind to do with me. I didn't know those guys. I didn't know their intentions or motives. I still have no idea who the hell Carla was. I have regrets, but I know it wasn't my fault. We were all so young and hardly had any life experience. It taught us a lot. I'm just happy and now thank God that nothing worse happened. It's not my fault and those guys shouldn't have done what they did to us. Well, I don't blame myself anymore. I think we just happened to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. For a bit of background information, I'm a guy from Mississippi and I was around 19 at the time this took place. I lived in a small trailer with my dad and brother for the first 16 years of my life before my brother, who I'll call Gunner, moved out due to him and my father always fighting. After my brother moved out, my father and I moved a county away, therefore the trailer was left vacant. A couple years later, I started dating this girl, who we'll call Chelsea, and my brother was dating her sister, who we'll call Mariah. We all decided to move into the vacant trailer because at the time, there was no other option. We needed a place to stay fast, and that was our option. Keep in mind, at the time, my girlfriend had two kids and Mariah had four. This is where the story begins. My brother had and still has a meth addiction, and it causes him to be violent and aggressive when he's high. The entire time he and Mariah were together, they would nonstop argue and fight. Several times it became physical and the police were called. All in all, the police were called eight times while we lived together. Anyway, the first big event happened around Christmas of 2017. My brother had been high for four days and was trying to start an argument with Mariah just to get an altercation started. This is how he was when he was high. Tensions rose and he wanted to take their six month old son away and stay at her grandparents' house a quarter mile down the road. Mariah wasn't going to let him take him in this condition, so Gunner grabs one of his hunting rifles from my room and puts everyone at gunpoint and says, and I quote, If anyone tries to take Cody away from me, I'll fucking kill you. At this point, everyone froze in fear. He was standing there with a six-month-old baby in his arm, and a .308 caliber rifle in the other pointing at me, Chelsea, Mariah, and the five other children. He then leaves out the back door and proceeds to walk to my grandparents' house in 30 degree weather with a six month old baby with just a blanket. Chelsea and I drive down to my grandparents' house and end up calming him down long enough to convince him to give back Cody so we can get him home and make sure that he is safe 
and everyone else is safe. Not even five minutes later, my dad is pulling into the driveway where my brother was at to see what was going on. At the time, I was in the bathroom pissing, and when I walked out of the bathroom, my brother walks up to me so high that he pushes me onto the ground for no reason. For some reason, this just flips a switch. I get up, ready to fight, and my dad gets behind Gunner and puts him in the chokehold. Keep in mind, my dad is a big guy, around 5'11", but husky and strong. My brother is also 5'10", husky and strong as well, but he had his youth to his advantage, so my dad wasn't able to keep hold of him for long. I'm only 5'6", around 130 pounds, so my dad is restraining my brother. I take the opportunity to punch my brother in the ribs as hard as I can, while I can. I mean, come on, what else are you going to do when you're this small in comparison? My brother finally breaks free and starts to swing on me. By a miracle, he never lands a punch, and I get out of there, and my father is able to subdue him without anyone getting hurt. He ended up just talking some shit and leaving with my father. The next incident happened a couple months after, around February. By the way, Mariah was still together with Gunner after everything that happened for some reason. I was at H&R Block filing my taxes when I get a call from Mariah, panicking, saying my brother had just beat the shit out of her and was cutting himself with a knife, telling me I needed to come home right away. I ended up getting home about 20 minutes later to find Mariah with a swollen face and my brother nowhere to be found. He came back about 10 minutes later and was wanting to get his belongings. I sat on the porch when he asked me if I would help him get his stuff. I told him, fuck no, look what he did to Mariah's face. All of a sudden he started swinging on me and when I got up from the chair, he pulled my hoodie over my head like a pussy and I ended up pushing him off the porch. When I got my hoodie off, my uncle that had brought him to the house made him get in the truck and leave before the cops got there. Mariah made a report to the cops, but she didn't press charges because they told her that she would have to go to jail too because of domestic violence. Yeah, sounds stupid, right? A couple weeks later, Mariah, Chelsea, and I were sitting at home and Mariah asked if I would drive her down the road to get some weed. We lived in the back roads where we had a weed dealer about a mile away. As we are driving to his house, we see my brother in someone's yard. Mariah wants to be petty, so she honked the horn as we pass. We pull up to the weed guy's house, and she gets her sack. And when we pull out of the driveway, we see my brother in my grandma's car coming downhill towards us. He gets about 50 feet away and swerves over into our lane. Thinking he was just trying to fuck with us, we think nothing about it until he's about 10 feet away and never gets over. So I hit the ditch to avoid him. He ends up swiping the car and pulls over and gets out and tries to pull me out of the car. We ended up going home to call the police because I had left my phone there. And the police couldn't do anything about it since we technically left the scene of an accident. I know, cops in my area are rather useless. We ended up totaling my grandma's car and completely fucking up the doors. My grandparents ended up giving me the car he totaled because my car was the exact same model as theirs and I could use their parts if I needed it. One day, while I was at work, my brother goes down to my house and takes the piece of steel and smashes out the windows of the car and even destroyed my mailbox. Once again, the cops didn't do shit about it. For the next couple weeks, my brother would send texts to Mariah saying that he's watching her and would even stay at the cemetery across the road from my house and watch us at like 3 in the morning just to see who came over. My brother was the type of guy that couldn't stand anyone being with his ex. He went as far to sneak into the house in broad daylight while Chelsea and I were at work and he left a note saying, For Mariah, I'm watching you, while she took a nap with the kids. If you're wondering, our doors didn't really lock. That's how he got in. About a month later, Mariah gets back together with her ex-boyfriend and baby daddy to her other kids. And we'll call him Ricky. 
One morning, Chelsea and I leave for work at 6 a.m. We get about 20 minutes down the road when Mariah calls us, telling us that we need to come home because Gunner had snuck down to our house through the woods around 10 or 11 o'clock at night and stayed in one of the vehicles all night waiting for us to leave so he could get inside and fight Ricky. Apparently, he tried to pull Ricky out of bed, but couldn't because he had a hold of the end of the bed. When he realized he couldn't, he started talking shit, and while this was all going on, Mariah snuck out to call the police. The police came, but didn't do anything because my brother told him that the trailer belonged to my dad and that he had the right to be there. A couple days go by, and all of a sudden out of nowhere, Gunner stops by with my two uncles while Chelsea, Ricky, and I are at home watching TV. He starts spouting off stuff to get Ricky to come outside to fight him. So Ricky puts on his boots and walks outside. As soon as he does, Gunner grabs him by the throat and drives him into the kid's playhouse on the porch. I go behind Gunner and pull him off. And when I do, Ricky gets up and starts throwing punches at Gunner, landing a couple. They end up on the ground with Ricky wrapped around Gunner, choking him until my uncles pulled them apart. Gunner gets in the truck, still mouthing off as they are leaving, and is visibly pissed when he sees that his head is all bruised up from getting tagged. The next day, Ricky drives down to my grandparents because the kids had told him that Mariah had gone down there to see Gunner. I know, Mariah is absolutely stupid. He pulls up and Gunner is telling him to leave and that this is his house. Ricky says he isn't leaving until Mariah comes outside. Gunner says he's going to hit him in the head with the metal folding chair that was sitting on the porch. Ricky tries to call his bluff and walks up to him and Gunner hits him, dropping him to the ground. Gunner gets on top of him and starts beating him until my grandpa comes outside and makes him get off. He comes home later with a couple of bruises, but nothing too serious. A couple days later, Mariah and Gunner get into another fight because Gunner was apparently cheating on her and things escalated very quickly. Long story short, Gunner is chasing after Mariah on a four-wheeler, shooting at her with a pistol while she is in the truck with her son. Like every time before, the cops didn't do shit. Mariah finally wised up and moved in with her mom to get away from Gunner. And the day after she moved, Chelsea and I were working and came home to find our TV had been stolen. Mariah came back down to the trailer the next day to get the rest of her stuff when my brother saw her and stopped by to start another altercation. Things escalated again. Gunner took the keys to Mariah's mother's car and threw them into the field next to our house. She jumped into the car and locked herself in there, trying to keep him from attacking her. My brother took a brick that was laying on the ground and tried to smash the window out. Somehow, by some miracle, the window never broke, so he decided to beat up the car instead. After he got tired, he finally left, and when we got off work, we searched the field by our house for two hours trying to find the keys. We never did, so the car was towed, which cost $100. Mariah's mother pressed charges, and he was charged with destruction of property, over $500 worth of damage, which made it a felony. The next day our air conditioners got stolen while we were at work, so that drew the line for us. We moved into one of our co-workers house the next night, and after that, the problems with my brother stopped. We were finally able to sleep at night, knowing Gunner wouldn't bother us anymore. Now it's 2020 and my brother has a warrant out for his arrest for not seeing his probation officer. It's bad to say I honestly hope he goes to prison so he stays away from us because a year after we moved we ran into him a couple times and he was nothing but trouble both those times. I'm sure I missed some things but that's the majority of it. The story might not seem as scary as others you hear but it was a nightmare to experience it firsthand. Some nights I laid awake, afraid to go to sleep, in fear of my brother coming in and killing us in our sleep. Things had gotten that bad. For anyone thinking about trying meth, please don't ever do it. It will completely ruin your life in a heartbeat and make you lose everything. Take it from experience. It's not worth it.
So today has been slow at work, and I've been killing time reading these stories. Maybe enough time has passed so I can share mine. I had a friend who was really into a cult. Unfortunately, I was the one that got him turned on to it. We had a mutual appreciation of the paranormal and all things weird, so I thought the subject would interest him. He started going deep into the subject, to the point where he wouldn't talk about anything else. He would actually interrupt a conversation and force the subject back to occult matters. Rude. But sometimes people go through phases where their interest is all they want to talk about. It was a mostly forgivable offense. I think I should mention that this particular friend didn't have a very large friend circle. His depression and introverted nature kept him inside a lot. He didn't have the best luck in relationships with women. His world was kind of small and I did enjoy hanging out with him so I did my best to be a good friend. I didn't want to brush him off because he was acting a little weirder than normal. Honestly, for the longest time, he was a totally normal guy. We chat and play games together on PlayStation. Sometimes we'd go see movies with my boyfriend accompanying us. We hung out all the time at the park. We went swimming and overall had a good time hanging out. Things started to go downhill when he started to smoke DMT. I think psychedelics are amazing tools that can offer insights into your life, but they should be treated with respect. My friend got to the point where he was making it himself, and he was smoking it daily, multiple times a day. For those who aren't familiar with the substance, when you smoke it, you get transformed to a different world, and an entirely new plane of existence. Your body and yourself don't exist anymore. My personal experience with it led me to see a dragon once in this kaleidoscope of a cornucopia. People see all kinds of things on it. Imagine what that does to a person when they smoke it 30 times a day. He started telling me things like he was the reincarnated Osiris. He said that he was seeing hieroglyphics all over the place. Apparently, he had an hour long conversations with entities in his bedroom, even when he wasn't smoking. Of course, I was very alarmed to hear all of this and told him that he needed to take a serious break, no drugs at all for a few months so he could find a solid footing in reality again. At this point, I was still hanging out with him because he obviously needed some help and like I said before, he didn't have a lot of friends that could give him that. He was also the black sheep of his family, so I knew he wasn't getting any kind of support from them. He was really close to his sister, and I did reach out to her on Facebook to express my concerns. I pushed her to talk to him into getting some psychiatric help because he was slipping past the point of no return. I'm not really sure if she took my messages seriously since we didn't really know each other. Plus, she is at least six years younger than us and possibly didn't grasp how serious the situation was becoming. In any case, I'll jump forward now to the part that things started to get real creepy. My boyfriend and I had made arrangements to hang out with our friend at the park. I didn't really want to go because I felt like I needed a break from him. I couldn't deal with it on that particular day. My boyfriend said he wasn't all that bad and we went anyway. We get to the park and he's his usual self ranting about Egypt and made up gods that only he knew. He also had a large hunting knife that he kept fiddling with the whole time that we were on the walk. He told us that he had been using it in ceremonial magic and that it helped him banish negative thoughts. This made me extremely uneasy. He would do this thing where he would take the knife and make stabbing motions near his heart or head like he was mock stabbing himself all while holding a conversation with me and my boyfriend. I think we were both on edge and didn't know what to say or do about it. I tried to distract him from doing it by bringing up subjects that might interest him, but he kept on with his ritual. Keep in mind, we're walking on a trail, so it isn't like we could just say goodbye then and there. We had to walk back to our car and drop him off at his car. My boyfriend had the bright idea that we should get some lunch after our walk, even though I was doing my best to give him a look that said, No, you crazy fuck. Why would you think I would want to spend any more time with this nut? but it must not have been very effective or my boyfriend was just ignoring it, not sure. 
Either way, we ended up getting to the car and going to lunch. In the car I was driving, my boyfriend was in the passenger seat and our weirdo friend was in the back. As we're heading through the busy part of town, where all the shopping and restaurants are, I hear the distinctive sound of a belt buckle coming undone. Then I hear the worst sound imaginable. I peek back in the corner of my eye and my suspicions are confirmed. This crazy fucker was full on jacking off in our back seat. I mean, pants way down, bare ass on the seat, beating it so hard like he wanted to rip it off. Instinctively, I felt sick to my stomach and all the nervous energy I had throughout the day popped up into my head. I was trying not to shake and trying to ignore it and drive through the heavy traffic. I kind of had a freeze response, I guess. The whole time I kept thinking about the huge knife he had in his pocket and obviously he was completely off his rocker. I was afraid to say anything or confront him because I didn't know how he would react. This part is nuts, but my boyfriend didn't even fucking seem to notice. The whole time he kept rambling on about God knows what. I couldn't listen to him because my thoughts were 100% focused on driving and trying to act like I didn't know what was going on in the back seat. We got to the restaurant and my boyfriend runs in to grab the food. I'm left alone in the car with our friend and I'm trying to act like I'm browsing my phone when really I'm watching and listening as hard as I can. We don't talk. My boyfriend gets back in the car and I complain that I'm tired and it's been a long day. Let's drop him off, etc. So I drive us back to our friend's car and he doesn't get out of the vehicle. He just sits there. I have to get a little rude and ask him to please get out so I can go home. He gets out of the car and walks over to the passenger side. I start getting really scared and I suspected the worst. He pulled a gun out of some kind of bag he had on the seat and he just walks over to our car with it. I don't know why the fuck I did this, but I was so pissed I just got out of my car and walked right up to him. I was maybe three feet away from him and I could see it was a loaded 9mm. I kept asking him over and over again, what are you doing? Because apparently that's all my brain could think of. I told him to get into his car and go home. He never said anything during this whole time, just kind of cried and had this wild look in his eye. For whatever reason, he got back to his car and drove off. I told my boyfriend obviously we're never going to hang out with him again and I didn't even want him to talk to him anymore. No contact. A few months pass and he occasionally messages me through the PlayStation or text my phone. He says a lot of random stuff and I just ignore it. It turns out he moved to Tennessee near Nashville. I don't know why. He had a roommate and I think his girlfriend lived there. I'm not really sure about the situation. I think maybe he's turning his life around and getting a fresh start down there. I'm not interested in any kind of friendship with him and I know he needs help beyond what I could offer. Again, I reached out to his sister and let her know that he had a gun. She managed to get it from him somehow, but it did a little good in the end. I get a call around 11pm one night that wakes me up. It's a man claiming he's a detective in Gallatin, Tennessee, and my heart skips a beat. I start sweating and immediately ask what happened. Apparently, my former friend stabbed someone to death on Halloween day. I don't know all the details, and the articles about it are kind of sparse. The whole thing is really surreal, and I'm just feeling like I'm lucky that I didn't get shot last summer. This whole thing turned out way longer than I meant it to be, but that's the story. I'm still feeling creeped out by the whole ordeal, and I'm kind of feeling sick after writing this. I had an acquaintance in high school who had some issues. He had a disability. My school had a very progressive population. Lots of anti-bullying campaigns. Of course, he was bullied a little bit, but the majority of the school was nice to him. He was very mean. He was constantly cussing at other kids and threatening them. I remember in 8th grade, we were in the same science class. We had to give a presentation on nuclear weapons and debate on whether dropping nukes on Japan was the right choice. He printed out pictures of the victims of the bombs. He kind of laughed a little while as he talked about it. 
He went into full detail about their deaths. The teacher had to tell him to stop and sit down. No one was laughing. Everyone was kind of creeped out. There was also another time a kid mocked him in the hallway. He turned around and said very calmly and confidently, You won't be doing this when I show up with a 12-gauge. Are you Christian? I bet God won't save you. It sent chills down my body. From then out, I stayed as far away from him as possible. He lived with his grandparents, and they took great care of him. One night, his grandfather had came home, and there was an argument. The boy went into his grandparents' room and grabbed the 22 rifle and shot his grandfather multiple times. His grandfather died a few days later at the hospital. I was at juvenile court later on. I did something dumb and had to appear in front of a judge. Sure enough, I saw the boy. He had been locked up for a while. He was in a green jumpsuit and was handcuffed. He was being escorted into a courtroom ahead of the rest of us. He saw me and apparently recognized me. He smiled at me, but not a friendly smile, a creepy one. One that sent chills down my spine. I never saw him again after that, and I'm not really sure what happened to him. When I was 10, my female cousin and I were dropped off at the movie theater by my mom while she ran some errands in town. We decided to go see a horror movie called The Village. I am tall, so I looked older, and my cousin was 14 at the time. We got super bored and decided to leave, so we got up. We walked out and stood at the entrance of the movies and rang my mother to come pick us up. Not five minutes later, a couple, about 40, well dressed, came out and we recognized them as being in the same movie room as we were. They walked over to us and started asking us questions like, why did you guys walk out? Did you not like the movie? How old are you? We told them that we were bored, and I honestly forgot how old we told them that we were. We also told them that we were waiting for my mom to come pick us up. And they asked, do you want to wait for her at our place? We told them no, and they asked, are you sure? And something else I can't really remember. They then walked away from us, but not out of the movies, and started talking. A few minutes later, they come back and ask us again, and then walked out. The dick behind the popcorn counter then said we couldn't wait inside and we had to go outside. It was a really small crappy place. We told him what happened and he either didn't believe us or didn't care because he still made us go. I think there's more to the conversation but I can't really remember. I think my cousin told them that my mom wouldn't know that we were with them and they said ring her and tell her or we'll ring her and tell her once we get to their house or something along those lines. Sometimes I wonder if they were genuine, but who asked a pair of kids to go back to their place? This happened a few months ago. I was at a club for my friend's birthday, and we had a table with around a dozen friends with us. When we get there, a guy immediately starts hitting on me. He seemed super weird, and I had a boyfriend, so I politely declined his advances. Then shit got weird. While out, I feel like I see him everywhere, and it started to freak me out a bit. But at the time, I didn't have a sense of any danger. Fast forward an hour. I'm chatting with a friend from high school who happened to be the bartender. Creepy guy comes up and orders a drink for him and myself, which I decline, and I explain to my bartender friend that we already have a table, so I'm good on drinks. Creepy guy did not like that. He gave me shit about not accepting his offer and that he was just trying to be nice. However, during his nice guy speech, he picked up my drink to refill it, which I again declined and asked him to excuse me while I chatted with my friend. I finished my drink, the one he picked up earlier, and finished it without thinking much more of the creeper. About 30 minutes later, I become sick and disoriented and I had my friend help me to the restroom since I felt so dizzy. After a while, I felt sick again and my female friend was nowhere to be seen, so I walked myself to the bathroom. While waiting at the door, 
The creeper swooped in and held on to my waist very tight and asked if I wanted to come to his table upstairs to meet his friends. I kept telling him no, that I needed to go back to my friends, and he began dragging me towards the stairs, telling me a list of disgusting perverse things that I refused to write here. At that point, I was terrified, but my legs literally did not work. He was carrying me up the stairs. As soon as he got up there, he requested his valet to go home. At this point, I knew I was in danger, but my purse was missing, and so was my phone. While he's waiting outside, the bouncer makes a comment about my behavior, and the creep shrugs it off as too much alcohol. As we are waiting for the valet, six of my friends burst out from behind the door and begin screaming at the creeper, while one of the female grabs me and pulls me back inside. I passed out soon after and woke up about 5 p.m. the next day on my friend's couch. I thought I had alcohol poisoning until I went to the emergency room and found out that I was drugged with ketamine while out the night before. This guy intended to drug me and take me home with him. Since then, I have refused to go out without my boyfriend always around me. I have avoided that bar at all costs in case that creeper ever comes back and I know to watch my drink like a hawk whenever I'm out. A valuable life lesson learned from a terrifying experience. Thank you all for listening. If you enjoyed, be sure to leave a like and remember if you need advice or have problems. You're not alone and I check my emails every other day and I check my comments every day. So anyway, again thank you all for listening. I hope you have a pleasant evening. Thank you.